Hello, and welcome to all of you who are joining us today on Facebook or YouTube. I'm Paul Derica, Director of Exhibitions at the Newberry Library, and I'm speaking to you from within our fall exhibition, Decision 1920, A Return to Normalcy. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about the word most associated with the 1920 presidential election, and that word is normalcy. Now, what do we mean by normalcy, and what do we mean by return to it? Well, the Republican candidate in 1920, Ohio Senator Warren G. Harding, is the person most associated with this word. And a lot of people think that he, in fact, was the person who coined the term normalcy. This isn't absolutely correct. And I want to thank uh, the folks at Merriam-Webster who've done a lot of research on the term. Um, and what you discovered, or what they discovered, is that normalcy uh, is a term that did exist in mathematics and was used since the mid 19th century. You will see a couple other references to it in the newspapers and in magazines in the late 19th century, but it really doesn't become a word known to most Americans until that 19, uh, uh, 1920 presidential campaign. And Warren G. Harding most likely meant to say normality, um, but on the 5th of July, 1920, he had arrived back in Marion, Ohio, which was his hometown, where he was going to run a front porch campaign. He had traveled from Washington, D.C., because he was a senator there, all the way back to Ohio. And when he gets back to Ohio, he's greeted by a crowd of 50,000 people. And he gives the first of his speeches from the front porch of his home. And in that speech, he calls out the incumbent president of the United States, the Democrat Woodrow Wilson, and accuses him of basically one man rule, of ignoring Congress and kind of making decisions entirely on his own. And Harding pledges that if he is elected, it will be a return to normal men and back to normalcy in terms of how the government is managed. But as I've mentioned, what exactly is normalcy? And what exactly would the country be returning to? And what did Harding mean by that? Well, the answer is interesting and also fairly complicated. So let's talk about some of the issues in the 1920 campaign. So in August of 1920, the 19th Amendment would be ratified. Uh, this amendment granted suffrage to women all across the United States, allowing them to vote at all levels, local, state, and national. So when Harding was making a call for a return to normalcy or to go back to normalcy, did he mean that he was against the ratification of the 19th Amendment? Well, not really, um, which I'll get to in a moment. In fact, Harding was in favor of the ratification of the 19th Amendment and the extension of suffrage to all women voters. Let's talk about another issue that really didn't get a lot of attention in the 1920 presidential campaign, despite having been something that was top of mind of many people in the summer of 1919. And that was issues around civil rights, and also around race and racial injustices and inequities. Uh, in towns both small and large, places like Chicago, Illinois, but also smaller towns like Marion, Ohio, in the summer of 1919, civil unrest broke out around long-standing racial injustices. Now, neither campaign, the Democrats or the Republicans, really wanted to address this uh, issue, and it's not really present in their platforms. But when Harding is making a call for a return to normalcy, like, what does that mean to voters of color? Well, since it wasn't an issue that the campaigns were playing up and, and, and really kind of attempting to address, it was up to others to kind of make sure that voters were aware of it. In 1918, there had been introduced into the House of Representatives a bill, that, a bill in support of a federal anti-lynching law. Uh, this bill didn't go anywhere in the House, um, but then in 1922, it would be introduced into the House again, voted on, passed and then sent to the Senate where it wouldn't be taken up. Now what you're looking at here is a map that was produced by the NAACP in 1922, which documents lynchings that have occurred since 1889 all across the country. And it was really organizations like the NAACP that were trying to raise awareness around these issues and not the political parties. So when Harding meant a return to, to normalcy, he wasn't even really I think, thinking about issues of race or class necessarily. But there were some other things also top of mind for voters in 1920. So in January of 1920, and what I'm showing you here is a cartoon by the Chicago Tribune, a political cartoonist 
John T. McCutcheon. Uh, McCutcheon was an editorial cartoonist from the 1890s all the way through the 1940s. And his cartoons provide a great sort of documentation of the 1920 presidential election. He certainly was cued in to Harding's use of normalcy, which we'll see in a minute. Uh, but another issue in, in 1920 that was top of mind for voters had to do with the uh, ratification of the 18th Amendment. Even though that had occurred in January of 1919, it went into effect in January of 1920, and it resulted in national prohibition. Um, so what you see here is McCutcheon has this reporter character, and he's interviewing this businessman, right? This man of means, this important figure. And he's asking him about all of these different issues of the day. And you can see the businessman has a fairly muted response, right? He, he doesn't seem that very invested in what the reporter is asking. But then, I mean, he's even yawning down here in, in this column. But then the reporter gets around to asking him about prohibition and he can't even get the word out before the man explodes. So when the Harding campaign was talking about a return to normalcy, well, prior to January of 1920, normality meant that people were allowed to drink and that there was no prohibition on the sale, manufacture, or transportation of intoxicating beverages. But that wasn't quite what Harding meant when he said a return to normalcy. And then probably the issue that um, distinguished the two parties the most was how they regarded the role of the United States in the larger world. So bear in mind, in 1920, you know, the United States had sent soldiers over to fight in World War I, which had ended in November of 1918, but the country was still very much kind of feeling the effects of the First World War. Um, so one of the things that was an outgrowth of the war was the peace, and the peace involved the United States potentially joining a new international body called the League of Nations. And then the League of Nations is best understood as a sort of precursor to today's the United Nations. It would be this international body that could arbitrate in future conflicts and hopefully maintain the peace. And here's another McCutcheon cartoon where the democratic orator is attempting to address this issue of, of I was attempting to address a crowd, but there's this little dog figure who keeps dogging him um, about the League of Nations, you can see here. Um, so in terms of Harding talking about a return to normalcy, did that mean a return to isolationism? Once again, it's a, it's a little vague in, in terms of what he meant, and that was somewhat intentional. So for those of you who are joining us um, on YouTube or Facebook, once again, I'm Paul Dorica, the director of exhibitions at the Newberry. We're coming to you live from uh, the Newberry itself and our fall exhibition, A Decision 1920, A Return to Normalcy. Um, oops, oh no, looks like we've got a question here. Uh, well, I address the 1918 pandemic. Uh, the wonders of technology, you get little chat questions. Yes, and I think the other thing to talk about uh, when we're discussing this election is that 1920, um, you know, voters were, coming off of four years marked by challenges and changes. Uh, the League of Nations, as I said, is directly connected to the involvement of the United States in World War I. Americans had also been sickened by and survived a global pandemic. Um, and they were dealing with things like prohibition going into effect and suffrage being you know, extended to women. So in the midst of all of these profound changes, something like a call for a return to normalcy would seem comforting. But as I said, it didn't mean quite what voters might think. And even Harding himself attempted to have it both ways. So Harding decides to run his campaign um, from the front porch of his home in Marion, Ohio. And here's a postcard of said home with said front porch and Harding on the front of it. And, you know, People and a lot of Harding's critics would mock him for his use of this term, normalcy. They would point out that he most likely intended to say normality, um, that normalcy, while as I mentioned, was a term occasionally used, uh, was not a common term by any stretch of the imagination in 1920. Um, but Harding embraced it, would use it in speech after speech, 
And then what he attempted to do was to try to kind of clarify what he meant by it. So when we hear a phrase like back to normalcy or a return to normalcy, we think of something that's meant to be a regression, right? Um, perhaps here we are in 1920, or at the start of a new decade, but this seems to be suggesting that maybe we should go back to where the country was at the beginning of the century, or at the beginning of the 20th century. But what Harding actually tried, or what Harding claimed he meant, was that he wasn't against progress per se. Instead, when he said normalcy, what he really meant was he wanted regularity and steadiness. So the country would still be moving forward into the new decade of the 1920s. It just wouldn't be moving at the same kind of rapid pace as it had been in the previous decade. His critics didn't entirely buy it, and his Democratic opponent, Cox, tried to make a sharp contrast with Harding by claiming that Cox, quote, said, I am for progress. Uh, and so that really became the kind of big sort of battle between the two campaigns. Now, there's another way, though, in which Harding's use of normalcy is actually appropriate for the style of campaign that he ran in 1920. So as I mentioned, Harding, you know, shortly after getting nominated, returned from Washington to his home in Marion, Ohio, and almost up until the election itself, he conducted his campaign from the front porch of his home. People would come and see him there, delegations of voters. It's estimated about a half a million Americans traveled to see Harding on his front porch. So in some ways, that campaign strategy very much aligns with a term like normalcy. So, you know, this is a, a campaign strategy that's based on like promoting small town values, traditional, in quotes, American values. It's also building on uh, nostalgia towards past presidential campaigns. Uh, William McKinley, who was also a candidate from Ohio, had run a front porch campaign in 1896. Before him, James A. Garfield, yet another candidate from Ohio, had also run a, a front porch campaign back in 1880. So there was this kind of tradition. And in some ways, you know, front porch campaign being paired with a term like normalcy makes a lot of sense. But as I said, normalcy cuts one way towards tradition, towards nostalgia, but it's also a relatively new word for, for 1920. And that captures something else about the Harding campaign. So even though they were using a traditional campaign form, the front porch camp, you know, the front porch approach to engaging voters. They were also making use of all of the different forms of emerging mass media to really engage voters. So those who couldn't come to Marion to see the presidential candidate could get to know him through songs like the uh, sheet music that we see here, in which if you were to visit our exhibition at the Newberry, uh, Decision 1920, Return to Normalcy, you'd actually be able to hear these campaign songs, uh, but just not uh, but songs not just in sort of traditional campaign songs that might resemble a military march, uh, but Harding also campaign also had songs written in a kind of more jazzy form uh, by such figures as the Broadway star Al Jolson, for example. Um, you know, the Harding campaign also, you know, made sure to make extensive use of photography. So as these different people were coming to Marion, some of them were celebrities like Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. Others were baseball players, like the entire Chicago Cubs team visited Marion in September of 1920 and played an exhibition game against the local team there. All of these events would be documented and then kind of sent out to newspapers and periodicals all across the country. There were newsreels of Harding. There were phonographic recordings of his voice, where, of course, he would talk about how we don't need no strums at this moment, but normalcy. And so in some ways, that word, right, um, which on the one hand gestures towards the past, is very much the kind of it word of 1920, perfectly encapsulates the campaign itself, which on the one hand is attempting to be backward looking, but is making use of all of the emerging forms of media to engage the, view, the voters of the moment. So how well did this attempt to return to normalcy resonate with voters? Well, on November, Second, uh, 1920, voters went to the polls and made their choice. They may have submitted their ballots in a wooden box, uh, like the one that you see here, which was once the property of the Chicago Board of Elections. Um, this gestures to the fact that even what's normal about voting could change. Um, because at that time, while people in Chicago were still using wooden ballot boxes, voters in other major cities across the United States 
we're already getting familiar with automated voting machines and Chicago would not transition to using one of these machines until 1948. What you are seeing here, it's not an automatic voting machine itself, but instead an instructional tool that was given to voters so they could learn how to use it. Uh, and you could see that in there, there's a couple of ballots and, a, and different like a levers that one could pull. It would allow one to potentially uh, vote a straight party ticket, or they could select candidates individually as well as uh, positions on various issues. So when voters you know, went to the polls uh, on November 2nd, 1920, what did they end up doing? Well, they did respond to this call to go back to normalcy or return to normalcy. And they gave Harding a rather decisive victory. He got 60% of the popular vote. Uh, that was the largest share that a candidate would get of the popular vote. With one exception, uh, the election of 1820, 100 years prior, in which James Monroe, during the so-called era of good feelings, ran unopposed. So you would hope he would get a good portion of the popular vote if he wasn't running against anyone. But Harding gets 60% of the vote. Uh, you can see just looking at the map that he did quite well in the Electoral College. Um, and he even manages to flip the state of Tennessee, uh, which was that 36th state which had ratified the 19th Amendment in August of 1920, uh, expanding suffrage to women all across the country. So uh, once, ah, let's see, we got another question, sorry. Teapot dome scandal, okay. I will get to that in a second. Um, so Harding is inaugurated in March of 1920 and I believe my colleagues who are kind of working behind the scenes have a cartoon for you uh, that was made by John T. T. McCutcheon in the aftermath of the election. Um, this cartoon is not featured in our exhibition, but I wanted to share it with you because it makes use of, of the word normalcy. And it suggests, so in, in this cartoon, um, McCutcheon has like a roadway and two automobiles. Um, and in some ways, you know, the cartoon gets at a normalcy is this term that seems to be both pointing backwards, but also forwards at the same time. So the outbound traffic are all of the problems associated with the previous eight years under Woodrow Wilson, and particularly the problems that were attached to America's involvement in the First World War. So what you see going out are like war profiteers and figures like that. But then, you know, the road goes both ways and it also goes backwards too, right back to normalcy. And there things are a little bit trickier. Uh, and you can see that uh, McCutcheon is a little, perhaps a little bit more suspicious about whether or not a return to a kind of simpler time in a simpler America is even possible. Now, a little bit later on in May of 1921, uh, he produced yet another cartoon that returns to this term, uh, normalcy. Uh, and in this cartoon, we see our kind of inquiring reporter character once again. Um, but instead, now he's interviewing a bunch of different kinds of people, uh, businessmen, laborers, um, boosters, and then just this gentleman here. Uh, and he's asking the same question each time what is normalcy? So even after Harding becomes president, there's still a lot of disagreement among the electorate as to what this term means. Um, and you can see here the response to the final gentleman um, that he interviews gives, which basically says, you know, high taxes, prohibition, high alimony are clouding life beyond redemption. We used to get building done reasonably, travel reasonably, go any place without passports, pay low taxes, have few strikes, get gold at the bank, and now what is it like? And you can see there's the gravestone saying that normalcy actually died in 1917 when the United States entered the First World War. And tragically, Harding himself would pass away uh, while still in office in 1923, by that despite his claim that he would return the country to a simpler, steadier time, instead his administration would be plagued by scandals, both personal and political. Uh, one of the most infamous being the Teapot Dome scandal, which involved the bribery of the Secretary of the Interior and the illegal leasing of um, government lands for the use of ex exploding petroleum on them. So I'm responding to Mark's question. Uh, and yeah, thank you all for joining me.
today. Uh, this has been a brief look at the term normalcy, uh, which became popular in the 1920 presidential campaign. I'm Paul Derica, the director of exhibitions at the Newberry Library. And I've been speaking to you from within one of our fall exhibitions, Decision 1920, Return to Normalcy. If you'd like to see the exhibition itself, see these John T. McCutcheon cartoons up close, or listen to the campaign songs uh, recorded from sheet music that's part of the giant James Francis Driscoll collection of American sheet music, you are invited to visit the Newberry Tuesday through Friday, noon to 4 p.m. All of our exhibitions are free. Thank you once again for joining us this afternoon and be sure to vote before November 3rd or on November 3rd.